that's about this day. Anyway, so, well, that, we're on record now. You know, Kier, thank God for Kier. Anything you need, honey, you can talk to Carolyn. <laughs> um, the guy's name is Amir Tisfasi or Tisfasi, something like that. He is a Messianic Jew that lives in Israel. He has family in the IDF, um, but he is one of the most amazing guys in the day in which we live. He, he has his thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the world, not just Israel, but what's going on in the world. He, <clears throat> he'll bring up photos of protests throughout the world. Remember when uh, in the end of February, when Pastor Carolyn and I took a few days off and went down to Miami, um, we were staying at a place uh, a little farther north on South Miami Beach than we did the year before. We stayed in a Cuban hotel the year before. I really was putting pressure on my eighth grade Spanish to stay there <clears throat> just so we could talk to our maids. Um, it was a Cuban hotel. Uh, this, this one we stayed in was uh, a little farther north, and it was in a Jewish community. You know, I'm walking up to go to a, to find a uh, Jewish bakery, <clears throat> and I actually found a French bakery in a Jewish community, so that was even better. The French really know how to bake, and, uh, and they were baking ch challah bread and all kinds of stuff, and, and I heard Amir say, I, I saw it on my, I got notified on my watch, and, uh, and he said, it's time for every Jew in the world to move to Israel. And what that's saying is, uh, see, this is how the Jews are going to survive this thing. They, go, they will go to the homeland. Back in the, in the 40s, Hitler, they didn't have a homeland to go to. They were scattered throughout Eastern Europe. And, and uh, <coughs> I don't know about you, but that part of history is, uh, uh, <clears throat> I enjoy watching movies about that, um, movies about, you know, the hiding place, remember the hiding place where Christians uh, hid and protected the Jews. Um, I've told some Jewish friends of mine that uh, <clears throat> if you can't find me and Carolyn and, uh, and, and our congregation, we, we, I did tell him. I told him this at the Kufi event. <clears throat> um, he's like a brother to me. He's uh, a Jewish man that uh, he, he uh, accompanies me down to Kufi events, and we go up on the Capitol Hill, um, and he even actually took me to uh, um, uh, what's, what's his name from Vermont? Bernie, thank you, Nadine. Bernie Sanders, who um, is not from Vermont, he's from New York. He's a uh, he's what the the Jews there. The, he's one of the Jews that uh, in his on his honeymoon when he got married, he took her to Moscow. This gives you an idea, kind of where his thinking is. He he is a reformed Jew. That means they have put aside the scriptures, the Torah the scriptures, and he's like a ship on the ocean with no rudder. And he's got a sail up there, and it just goes wherever it's supposed to go. Morning, men. Um, but anyway, so uh, he took me to his office, Bernie Sanders' office, down at Washington, D.C. We went there. Of course, Bernie wasn't there. None of, we, we, the only representative that ever met with us over a period of time was Kelly Ayotte. She was a U.S. senator down there uh, on the Republican side. Well, rumor has it she may be running for governor. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, we went down there and uh, Bernie was nowhere to be found. And uh, he's, but we, and, and this Brian Grodman, who's the friend of mine, he's a Jewish friend of mine. And uh, 
And he would accompany him out, and we'd go into these representatives' offices and speak to him about uh, supporting Israel and different things. And, and that's where we're addressing our representatives. And Carolyn and I just went down there this past Monday and Tuesday. Last Monday and Tuesday, we, we uh, boarded a plane Monday morning and flew down there and, uh, and proceeded to go to the house, the, the hill on, uh, concerning the House of Representatives. The Senate was not involved. They, uh, you know, the Senate is ruled by the Democrats. Chuck Schumer is the head of that, and uh, and you would you can't even tell he's a Jew. He, along with this administration, has been trying to undercut uh, Netanyahu's government in Israel while they're in the midst of a war. Uh, this is what you call walking on thin ice. There's a scripture, there's a few of them in the scriptures that talk about how the Israel people is the apple of God's eye. The apple of God's eye is the pupil. And when you do what this administration has been doing, you're putting your finger in God's eye. And uh, it's just the mercy of God that this guy is still alive. This would be the Old Testament. <clears throat> It'd be a puff of smoke, boom. Um, but the mercy of God, you know, anyway. So let's, uh, <clears throat> let's stand and just invite the presence of God in here. I know uh, technically he comes with all of us that are born again. And as we come together, it's a collaboration of anointings and things, and it actually this what brings us about, but we're going to officially invite the presence of God in here, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit is with us, guiding and directing us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come together on the first day of the week, the eighth day, Father, we thank you, and we welcome your presence in this place. We look to you to help us, the great teacher, the great helper the paraclete, one called alongside to help, the Holy Spirit. We look to you to rise up and live big within us, to hear through our ears, to see through our eyes and hear and to understand with our heart, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Father God, for your continual blessing, protection, and uh, um your presence in our life, we are so grateful. We're so thankful. You meet every need that we have. And, uh, and we look to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated, and uh, Kara may have something she may want to share with you that uh, will be very important. Morning. So good to see everyone here today. Just wanted to take a moment to welcome you. You're in the right place today. Praise God. You know, every time we come into these doors, we want to come expecting God to move, expecting to hear from God. Whatever issue you're going through today, God has an answer for you, and he has a message for you, a message of hope, a message of promise. You know, all his promises are yes and amen. Um, no really big announcements coming up. There are some Tommy Zito meetings coming up in May in the New England region, so uh, I've been sharing those on the Facebook page, so you can keep track of those there in Vermont, and mostly in Vermont coming up in the, the beginning of May. So uh, those will be really exciting. He's the evangelist that's been coming for the past two years and has a real heart for winning America to the Lord. Amen. Uh, lately, I've been kind of meditating on Matthew 6, especially the tail end of it where it says, uh, verse 31, it says, Don't worry about these things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbeliever, but your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. But I just love that, um, you know, God's taking care of all of our needs. I was reading 
uh, this little devotional I have, My, uh, My Utmost for His Highest by, uh, I think, Oswald Chambers. You can tell it's an older book because I haven't met anyone named Oswald in a long time. <laughs> um, but uh, he was bringing out how sometimes when we bring in this worry, we're actually doubting God's provision for our lives. And, um, you know, God said he will provide, and we can trust in that. You know, we're not, I don't think we're made to go through this life just always looking at work and trying to get to the next thing and just trying to survive. You know, God has taken care of that, and because of that, we can lift our eyes and focus on him and keep our focus on him and not on just providing for our everyday needs. So that's my little nugget of encouragement this morning. We'll go ahead and go into worship next. Lord. It's time to worship. Amen is right. Thank you, Lord. I was commanded to throw all my music under here. <clears throat> Let's focus on him and just worship him. He is so worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire the whole earth shakes the whole earth shakes I see his love and mercy washing over Hosanna, Hosanna 
Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands and thank the Lord. Lord, we just thank you. We are so grateful, Jesus. We're so grateful. All that you have done for us. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. How many love the scriptures? How many love the Bible? Just lift your hands up. Hallelujah. If it wasn't for the Bible, you would not be here. If it wasn't for the Bible, you would not be in the place that you're in today. The exposure that you have had to the Word of God, you cannot take that lightly. The Word of God is what brought this world out of the dark ages. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Hallelujah. And I'm sorry I haven't done a better job of bringing that across to this congregation and those that have been here before and had chosen to leave this place. That was all their cho choice. People that did things and should never have done those things. Hallelujah. But see, it's, uh, it doesn't just happen... In, in big places, you know. Uh, you know, when we first started the church, uh, God brought people all over the place. We had people coming down, coming over from Claremont. They saw a place, they saw the type of church that we were, and they were so grateful. And they, they, they started driving over. And two or three families started coming over. And uh, that knew each other. This is where Louise and Rick Broughton found out about the church. And they started coming over. And, uh, and the story's long, but, uh, but the enemy, <coughs> we, we had a move of God uh, in 1993. A gentleman called me up, and you know, we'd been praying. The, this is one of the benefits of sitting under, as Billy Brim would say, you know, the Lord brought her and sat her at the feet of the leading prophet of the day. That's how she says that. The Lord spoke that to her. And see, he, he did the same thing with Carolyn and I. Carolyn just supported me as she watched and saw the Lord lead us. You know, I spent that year and a half in her folks' basement and just uh, <clears throat> embalming myself with the Word of God and the presence of God in that, in that basement. Now, you may not totally understand that, but that's exactly what went on for a year and a half. We'd go to church on Sunday, but then... You know, we, we, wouldn't, we didn't have any social life, but Carolyn was fine with that. We were living with her folks. So she had her folks to fellowship with. And uh, once in a while, I'd come up and watch Pat Robinson. They, they loved watching the 700 Club. And Pat was a precious man of God. Pat loved Israel. Uh, and today his son has taken over, and, and he loves Israel. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> see... When you go over here, look, look over here and uh, yeah, um, go over, let's, let's, let's go here first. Uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 8, <clears throat> you're going to find that you're going to have to make decisions about what you love and what you Go after you have to make equality, as Brother Copen would say. This uh, first time I ever heard this said, but he got it from either Oral Roberts or Brother Hagen. He said you must, you got to make a quality decision that you're going to put the Word of God first place in your life. If you don't make the quality decision, you you, you won't do it. You may embrace it for a while, but you won't have that decision always there that you can always draw on. 
like the quality decision you made for those of you that uh, this applies to when you when you decided to marry your spouse that uh, see we Carol and I when we got married see we had uh, kind of exhausted some of the uh, opportunities and, and came to the place where we were ready to hear God and uh, find out who he had picked out for us. Um, and that came about, you know, we had already consecrated and dedicated our life to the ministry. If you ever heard her speak about it, she knew when she got saved, she got saved when she was 15 years old. <clears throat> and uh, her and her twin sister, they did everything together. And they got saved together. And uh, she knew in her heart that she was going to marry a minister. And, uh, and so when, I don't know how much she had it put together when we met at camp, but, you know, she s began to, s you know, see... We spent, you know, the first week was teen camp, so she, she had to obey the rules. And uh, then there came children's camp. She went back home to New Hampshire. And then the third week was family camp. She came back up with some of her relatives and stuff, and, and then we were able to spend time together, attend the meetings together in the... Uh, um, and let God speak to each one of us, you know, and then we committed ourselves. Um, then we made the decision. We came to the place where we made the decision that we, see, we, we met in June of 1978. We got married in February of 1979. So that was, but see, you can do that when you know God and you recognize God doing it. You know, we, we didn't have any other agenda. So here in the book of Luke, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And a certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits, and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom he went seven devils. This kind of gives you a little idea of the people that did follow Jesus, how they were delivered by the ministry of Jesus, and they, they committed their life to him. Well, this uh, Magdalene was one of them. Seven devils came out of her. And Jonah... Or Joanna, verse 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Now notice this. This is interesting. You'll see something is revealed here. It says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. And see, Chusa was part of Herod's administration. And Joanna, his wife, says, and Susanna... And Susanna and many other which ministered unto him, Jesus, of their substance. Now, there may be, there may be some men in there, but uh, for right now I do not recall the Bible pointing out men that actually supported Jesus' ministry. Nicodemus might have been one of them. But here it, it, it names two women right here, <clears throat> actually three, Mary Magdalene, she began to minister to Jesus. And Joanna, now she worked for, her husband was Chusa, who worked for Herod. And so he was, he had a steady job. And Susanna, and many others, it says, many others, which ministered unto him, that's Jesus, of their substance. You know what that means, right? Talking about they were supporting Jesus' ministry. And the ones that were mentioned, they said many others, the ones that were mentioned were women. 
I just recently came into a statistic that brings out that 80% of the stuff that gets done in the local church is done by women. Now, 80%. Now, if you're, you're a guy in here and you're, you're doing something, you got your hand to the plow in this thing too, well, you're part of that 20%. Um, but you, you want to be busy about God's business. Um, this is really, this is your greatest opportunity looking right at you here. Uh, God gives you a, 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 a church, a ministry that's, that's moving with him. And, and don't, don't ever be moved by what you see or, or stuff like that. God is, the uh, Bible talks about God adding to the church daily as such should be saved. You can manufacture people. You can do stuff. I've been involved with this kind of stuff before, but it, it really doesn't work like it's supposed to. It, uh, what you use to gr- get people's attention to come to church, you're going to have to use that all the time to get them to stay. But when you let God do it, you just stay with God, and they'll stay. You keep the, mo- the presence of God. You know, you, This is what we dedicated our life to, was to study the Word of God, to, to enjoy and to um, cultivate the presence of God. And see, I, I won't put up with just religion. Some of you might remember what it was like to go to a service and the presence of God not be there. You know, there's, you know, Brother Hagen mentioned some things to us when we were down in Bible school in our second year. He, he, he probably didn't want to do it in our first year. It might have overwhelmed us. But he said there is a counterfeit Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and, uh, and I've been around it, you know, uh, kind of grew up in it. Um, it's a religious spirit, not the Holy Ghost. But anyway, and continuing on, it says right here, it says, verse 4, when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spoke by parables. <clears throat> and uh, so I wanted you to see that these people, the Bible points out certain people here that actually ministered in Jesus' ministry. You know, when, uh, when, you watch, when you walk through the Gospels, you're seeing the ministry of Jesus right, uh, uh, right in front of you. And see, the, the neat thing about this, <clears throat> as you begin to see Jesus in the Scriptures and, what he, and how he dealt with situations and stuff, you know, when in John... Go over here to John chapter 14. In verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, or from now on, ye know him and have seen him. Well, Philip, standing right there, you know, Philip was hanging around John the Baptist. When Jesus went down to get baptized, In the River Jordan, that's when Philip saw Jesus. Prior to that, Philip was hanging around John the Baptist. He was one of his disciples. And he saw Jesus, and then from that moment on, he switched. Like many other disciples, they they left John and followed Jesus. And here Philip says this. He says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us or satisfy us. And Jesus looked at him, verse 9, he said, Say it unto him, and said, Have ye... Have I been so long time with you, yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? 
There's a lot into that. I remember when I first saw that, that helped me immensely. Because now I can get to know the Father is by watching Jesus. Getting to know Jesus through the scriptures is how you get to know the Father. Because Jesus is an exact reflection of him. <clears throat> anyway, so thank you, Lord Jesus. So if the ushers have come, we're going to receive the tithes and offerings for the church. And uh, and like I said, for those of you that have been around this place for any length of time, and you know God brought you here, and you know God's in this place, see, this is, this is what we want to do. We want to help other people see the same thing. Sometimes they need help. Sometimes, uh, you know, there are leaders and then there are followers. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes the pe God shows the leaders <clears throat> in, in such a way that they know, that they know that they know that this is one of those places. And so they, they hook their wagon to it. And, uh, and this is the very thing <clears throat> that God is looking for in people, and God will reward and honor faithfulness. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But see, that's the thing you want to do. Whatever you know God has shown you, God has revealed something to you, you want to be faithful in that. You don't do it just because somebody else is doing it, but you do it because you know that it's right. You know. <clears throat> this, is, this is what you're going to be rewarded in. The salvation is a gift, but what you do after you go through that door of salvation, what you do for the kingdom of God, I don't care what it is. It says if you give a glass of water, to a disciple, you won't miss out on your reward. Um, but, you know, honoring God. When you, when you see the scriptures that we go through and bring out different things so you can see it yourself, you know, uh, like, <clears throat> like over here in the book of uh, Leviticus. <clears throat> Last chapter, Leviticus. It says this. Verse 30. This is the Old Testament, but still you can receive from the Old Testament. It still pertains today. Uh, certain things, you know. There's things that uh, in the Old Testament that did not come through the cross. Like sacrificing a two-year-old heifer. Thank God you don't have to do that. Or we'd have to make, you know, we, we would have some of you guys busy, especially Sean is going to be busy back there building something to where we could sacrifice <clears throat> a two-year-old heifer. Uh, be, that, that was one of the, sacri uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, option, the, uh, but it was, the, it was something that was okay was okayed, you know, two-year-old heifer. Uh, now, but he made provision for somebody that did not have a lot of money. So that's what, if you look at Joseph and Mary, when they came and, you know, they were going up to see the priest after Jesus was born, you know, he was circumcised on the eighth day. But then also they brought an offering, and they brought, and, and uh, the provision was made for people that didn't have a lot. And it was like two turtle doves. You could bring that, and that would, that would be enough. But for those that were well off, the old heifer. But that did not come through the cross. Jesus fulfilled the sacrifice that's needed. And uh, aren't you glad for that? You know, and by the way, you know, you see, when they would bring that two-year-old heifer up to the priest. You know, the priest would come out and inspect. Who would he inspect? Did he inspect the guy bringing it? 
No, he inspected the sacrifice. So when you come to God, <coughs> God's not inspecting you. He's inspected already the sacrifice, who is Jesus. And guess what? He passed all the tests. So that sacrifice was accepted and made, made way for you to come into the presence of God. And you can do it every time. You can do it all every day. You know, you mess up, you just acknowledge it, receive, receive forgiveness, and just keep going. And you, you don't have to miss a beat. That's a nice thing about this covenant, a real nice thing. You have access to the throne of grace 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Wasn't, wasn't that way with the Old Testament. You have that now. Sometime when you don't have anything going on, open your Bible. You can go to Jeremiah. He was the originator of it. But then you can also go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, and also chapter 10. And he talks about, the writer of Hebrews brings out, and a new covenant I will make with the house of Israel. You know, and, and here he brings out, this is the tithe and the offerings that were accepted here in the book of Leviticus. And so when you are honoring God with what you have, God doesn't forget that. This is why there's a difference between some people. <coughs> um, you know, I'm convinced, I was... When we were down there in Washington, we had lunch with some of our friends. And uh, how many couples were there having lunch with us, honey? Four, five, six, something like that. And I was, I was talking to them about something. In, uh, <clears throat> and... Um, Who's I, who I talking about? Uh, oh, Peter. I'm talking about Peter. How Peter, you know, it just, you know, you know, Peter was the first one that had the revelation who Jesus was. See, if you go back and look at that, you'll see that Jesus begins. And one day I was reading the thing, and it just, it just came out. Uh, uh, how to explain it? It just came out to me, yeah, um, and this has happened to me numerous times from when I was in the basement, God would speak stuff to me, help me understand something. See, this is, this is the whole foundation. Then, you know, when I, I got through with that year and a half in there and going through all that stuff and doing it every day, day upon day, day upon day, you, you don't realize what really, it starts to build, the momentum build. God's showing you stuff. I mean, this is how I heard from God to know to go to, you know, Bible school, where to go. And God, God was right there meeting the need, too. You know, we didn't have any transportation. I had a car uh, before I met Carolyn. I gave it to a young man up in Vermont where I was staying, I boarded a room in, with a family there. And uh, they had just returned from Africa on the mid mission field, and they were in the middle of a divorce. You know, a real sad time. But they had two kids, and I was boarding a room in that house. I was, you know, upstairs across the hall was the young man, 16 years of age. His name was Eric. And a uh, precious young man. And it was, you know, I, I was there, and I led him to the Lord. <clears throat> and then I gave him my car. Just came up one day to give him the car. And, uh, <clears throat> but God, God took care of us. Um, so anyway, back, back down, back in the, in the room there, the day that I, was, I saw that, you know, when you go and look at Peter, um, and Peter, this is, this, is in, this is in Mark chapter 4. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Thank God spring 
is springing. It's serious. Spring needs to really take hold. Praise God. And uh, <clears throat> chapter Mark chapter 4. Um, and see, when Jesus... <clears throat> Jesus grabbed, got the disciples together and took them up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, uh, now, those of you that went to Israel with us, this is the place, <clears throat> if you can remember it, remember there was a place, uh, this big cave in the side of the mountain there, big cave. And uh, they, had, they said that was the entrance to hell. <clears throat> this is at the base of Mount Hermon. Just to give you an idea how far north this was. There's, there were two Caesareas. One was by the coast. This one is not by the coast. This is at the base of uh, Mount Hermon. And, uh, and this is where Jesus brought his disciples up there. He, the Spirit of God, now just go, th this will show you that, see, Jesus was uh, <clears throat> walking out the prototype of the new creature in Christ Jesus. And, uh, and so he was, you know, he laid aside his divine power and glory. He was the Son of God and is the Son of God. But in his earthly ministry, it, it talks about it in the book of Philippians, how he laid aside his power and glory and humbled himself and became a man and... Uh, he had to be led by the Spirit. He had to do exactly what we were doing. He was a prototype of what we were going to walk in. He was being an example to us. And so he had to walk by faith. He got up every morning early and would seek the face of his Father um, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, he went to the River Jordan when he turned 30 years of age and, and met John there, and John wanted him to baptize him. John had revelation of the baptize, baptism of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus told him, he said, no, we must fulfill all things. So John had to baptize him in water. So he put him under the water, and when he came out, what happened? The Holy Spirit came and descended on him, and it says, like a dove. But it wasn't a bird but it was like the way it lit on him and stayed. And this is, the, this is what the Word of God said. This is what the Spirit of God said to John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? That's where he was at that river. And it's, and it's told him, he said, When you see the Holy Ghost descend and light upon the individual and stay, that's him. That's what the Spirit of God showed John. So here he is. He sees him. And, you know, John looked up. And saw him coming. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember he said that? Now, he was the only one I've found in the Bible that had that revelation. Not even his mother saw that. But John saw it. Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away all the sin of the world. So, John wanted Jesus to baptize him. But he said, no, no. This must come first. See, he hadn't been sacrificed yet. But, but he was now the Holy Ghost. The Father sent the Holy Ghost on him. And the Father spoke. This was the first time you saw the Trinity in one place. Jesus was in the water. The Holy Ghost descended on him and stayed on him. And then the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And, uh, and so that was a big deal. <clears throat> that was a huge deal. So Jesus gets it in his spirit that one of the disciples knows who he is. And this is the way he had to go uncover it. He, uh, he takes him up there at, the, uh, uh, at, at that place. Caesarea Philippi, he takes them up there, and then he begins to do a little fishing. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He referred to himself as the Son of Man. Who do, 
Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? And they begin to throw out names. Some say you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Some say you're Jeremiah the prophet. Some say, and, and then he said, well, who do you say that I am? Now stay with me. Who do you say that I am? And out of nowhere came Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus saw it. It's Peter. Do you remember what Peter did that first day of Jesus' ministry? Here in Mark chapter 4. Jesus came down by the seaside. He, this is Capernaum. This is Capernaum. Now, those of you that went to uh, Israel with me, you remember Capernaum. This is the place, <clears throat> it's interesting there that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, the Catholic Church owns some of this. And it kind of, it kind of surprised me that they did, you know. Everything, that, you know, the Catholic Church was not, was not friendly to the Jews back in those days. When they, the Crusades, that was all the Catholic Church, you know. Anyway, but here, here and up there in Capernaum, Peter comes down and uh, Jesus inquires of him. Now, Jesus initiated the conversation. He asked him if he could use his boat. And Peter agreed, and, you know, Peter was washing his net there, and, uh, you know, he had, uh, and he agreed. He let, you know, he let him use the boat, so that pushed out from the shore right there, and Jesus got in the boat and began to teach. And uh, Rick Renner made the statement. He said he taught 13 parables that day, and this is the kickoff of Jesus' ministry up here in the Galilee area. And, uh, and here Peter is the one that's providing it's like providing transportation, but it's providing a way, a venue for Jesus to be able to teach all afternoon and stay right there and put in place. And the crowds got on the shoreline and just sat like it's, it's like a theater. It goes up. And uh, they all sat there all afternoon listening. Now, people came and gone. People came and went. Uh, and he comments on that. <clears throat> he says... Uh, he said, and he began to teach, this is Mark 4, verse 1, and he began to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat on, by the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables. Now, this is a neat thing. This is the thing, and I was talking about this in my prayer meeting Saturday, um, that you can... There are some things God has revealed to us, if we pay attention, how God operates. And uh, if, you go over, <clears throat> if you go over to Proverbs chapter 25, <clears throat> Proverbs 25. Don't you just love that prayer call? How he, he, he teaches us and he uses these scriptures. He'll, he'll throw out a phrase, but then he backs it up by scripture. Here in Proverbs 25, <clears throat> verse 1, it says, These are also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. They, these men found these writings of Solomon, copied them down. Verse two, and this is what he's, this is something. This is something revealed about the Father and how He operates. He says it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. He just doesn't reveal it. To everybody. It says here, see, that's, that's why parables. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Always remember that. 
God doesn't show everything. He surely doesn't show everything, anything. He doesn't show, he doesn't reveal things to the infidel. Now go back over to Mark, and you'll show us a little bit more. It says here, he said, hearken, and, and he taught many things by parables. Verse 2, he says, in Mark 4, it says, and he taught many he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, some fell, the seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, and, be, and because it had no depth of earth, because it had no depth of earth, and when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Another fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit. That sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. He's revealing something about the kingdom of God. Now, he's likening, using a story, a natural story, to bring it out. And, uh, you know, he talks about how the invisible things of the kingdom of God are clearly seen by what has been created Things that you can see in creation will reveal the things that have been uh, hidden. Even the Godhead, the Godhead, you know what the Godhead is, right? The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So he goes on, he says, uh, <clears throat> and, he said unto, and he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So he's not just talking about physical ears, because everybody there had physical ears, but that's not what he's referring to. He said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And you'll find out that your ears, not on just your head, but it's your condition of your heart that determines what actually you can pick up by the Spirit of God. So if you learn to walk in love, you learn the, the importance of walking in love. It affects your hearing. It affects you, what your, what your comprehension. And so, and also there's something in there, and I, and I brought this up at that little dinner, we, that luncheon we had with some of the people. It said it seemed like, see, it seemed like because of the, what the scripture says, it seems like what you do with what you have will determine what you receive. Peter invested in Jesus' ministry that main first day, it was getting off the ground. He get, lets him use his boat. It allows him to teach all afternoon. And when Jesus was done, remember what happened there? Uh, if you go back and look at it, Mark, I won't take the time today. I'll let you do some stuff. Uh, but when you go back and look at that, <clears throat> Jesus said, now go out into the deep and cast your nets for a catch. Well, Jim, you know, Peter felt a need to be able to explain to him his credentials. You know, he, Peter knew that Jesus was a carpenter, And Peter was a fisherman. And here Jesus is telling them what to do concerning a catch, a reward of what he, see, God's were rewarding him. He's rewarding him. Remember it says in the scriptures, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the, you have to diligently seek him. And he's a rewarder. He's not moved by, he's not a, he's not a, how did Peter say it in the book of Acts chapter 10? He's not a respecter of persons, right? He's not a respecter. You may be 
You may be a part of the royalty, but that doesn't give you an advantage in the kingdom of God. So he said, uh, he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then, and then and verse 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12. So it's not just the 12, but they that were about him, um, they ask of him the parable. And he said unto them, now notice what he says here in verse 11. He says, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without. You have to realize not everybody stayed. That's, that's who he's referring to as those that were without. There were people that got up and left while he's teaching. It happens today. It happens today. People get up at the most un, uh, un, uh, uh, yeah, not the right time, you know. Uh, and see, this is what I learned from Brother Hagin. Brother Hagin, there were times when Brother Hagin would call somebody out. See, he would flow in a prophetic anointing, and that teaching gift operating under that prophetic anointing was just something to behold. Uh, I remember sitting in that camp meeting, and he's teaching, and it's just, I, I can't explain it. It's like you took a bath. And see, but you have to respect and honor the presence of God. But see, there's a lot of people don't put that discipline in them. They give themselves liberty to just do whatever they feel like they do. You know, if your body, you know, tells you, you know, we better go to the bathroom right now and just get up and go and see, you don't realize you may miss something by, by just doing that. Now, of course I know, but see, sometimes you, you don't want to let your body rule you. You have to get to the place where you talk to your body. And tell your body to shut up. We're in the presence of God. Or if Jesus was sitting right here, which you know in a way he said, he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And he's here in our midst. Remember in the book of Revelation, he's walking through the churches? I believe this is one of the churches. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not based on me. <clears throat> it's based on uh, our faith in him. And we're following what he's shown us to do. That's why I'm not moved by what other people do. I don't do the same thing other churches do. I do what the Lord tells me, and I stay with it. I stay with it. I don't, I don't give up. And it doesn't, you know, that's why I said the Lord adds to the church daily it should be saved. And if we just be faithful, <coughs> Jesus' ministry, it tells us what he did in his ministry. And it said it right at the beginning, when we read it earlier, he said he went about teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. And God was with him. And then he got, when he got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you know, that's when he started his ministry there at the River Jordan. He, he left there, remember? He went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and then he passed the test, and they went back up to, uh, he went back up to the Galilee area, you know, and his mother was in charge of that wedding. <clears throat> that was the next thing in, on the agenda. And he brings all the guys up there, you know, and, uh, you know, and they ran out of wine. And the mo his mother comes to him and brings this up. Remember how she approached him? That's Jesus' mother. Interesting when you look at it, because his mother had great favor with, his, with her, her son. Jesus loved his mother. And that was the human side of him. And she came up to him and says, they are, they're, they're, they're out of wine. Remember at the wedding? And uh, weddings were a big deal. And here she's got authority in this wedding. She, she's the one that approached Jesus. And, uh, and it, it would last for days. And so Jesus has not begun to operate in that anointing 
He's just been anointed by the Spirit of God down there on that river. And he's coming up, and he hasn't, uh, hasn't got a direction yet of what he's going to do. See, he, this is what, what he showed us. He'd get up in the morning, and he would seek the face of God, and he would get the first thing on the agenda. God would show him the first thing to do, and he would go do it. Then everything was connected from then on. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? He was sent to a place. She reached out, and, uh, and she was healed of that thing. And you know, Jairus had just come by him, and he was with Jesus going to pray for his daughter, and the woman with the issue of blood interrupted him. And Jairus had to watch Jesus and not get all bent out of shape that that woman stepped in the way and, and he, he needs to get to his house and i got to have Jesus pray for my daughter. He, she was at the point of death. We don't have any time here, but see, when you're hanging around with Jesus, you'll see and you'll know you got to pay attention to everything he says. And he said, I'll go. I'll go with you, you know, I'll go, and he, and he proceeded to go, and then that woman with the issue of blood grabbed him and interrupted him, but God still got everything, you're still hanging on to what he said, I'm going to go with you, <clears throat> and I'll go pray for her. Well, he hadn't changed his mind, so don't change yours. God said he will take care of you, God will take care of you. Something gets away of that. Something happens. Maybe in the fam- somebody in the family, something happens. You hang on to those things he said to you. You don't let go of them. I don't care if you got a storm going on. You know, he gets in the boat. But he's been ministering all day. He gets in the boat. And, and pay attention to what he says. We're going to the other side. And he gets in the back of the boat and goes to sleep. He's tired. He has a physical body. It needs to rest. Well, they get out there, and they start heading that way, and all of a sudden, circumstances are changing. It looks like a storm. And, you know, he's going over to the Gadarenes, and there's a demonic presence over there that's, that's controlling that whole region. And the Holy Ghost is sending him over there to deal with it. Meanwhile, you know, they're in the boat, and he says, we're going to the other side. He didn't say we're going halfway and then, you know, storm's coming and we're going to swim the rest of the way. So you hang on to what he said. We're going to the other side. That storm rises up. You stand up and said, by God, he said we're going to the other side. We're going to the other side. Now go, storm. And he gets over there and he runs into that demonic presence and he deals with it. Actually, you know, there's two of them, but one just talks about one. But there were two men that were over there in the, in the graveyard cutting themselves and making, um, it was, that's where the word perilous comes in Timothy, where Paul said, in the last times, perilous times would come. That word perilous is the same word that describes that whole road that goes right by that Gadarenes there. You didn't want to go on that road. Because you would be confronted with these two demon-possessed men. And you wouldn't want to go through that. You didn't want to go there. That's how he described that thing. But when you're with Jesus, you know, he's with you. He's not bailing on you. But I had to learn that too. I, you know, you, you just don't always automatically see that. What did he say when he gave them the, got in the boat? You have to go back and listen to it. What did he say? What did he say to me when I first started, when we got here to the church, how he showed you the church? You know, you go back and look at what he said. He's commuted. When, you, when some of you first came here, um, you, you, something clicked. You, you know, you, you, you knew something was going on. Don't forget that. The enemy will do everything he can to get you to forget it, to go get you out of here. I mean, he's used, the same, he's used the same thing to other people, and it worked. They got him out of here. And, and, and many of them are floundering because, see, God isn't... See, you're going to have to repent in order to come back. 
Repent means to change your mind. It takes humility. And some people aren't willing to do it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to... Uh, did, we, did we receive the offering? Go ahead and receive the offering. Hallelujah. And then you can bring out the communion elements. We'll have communion. And receive <clears throat> the life of God. And we take the elements, receive, receive the life of God into our bodies in Jesus' name. And the life of God, healing and wholeness that is connected with this thing. Every time we do this, you go through it, you receive it. You'll be so glad you did. It is, communion is one of the greatest ways to uh, monitor and to nourish and just deal with your health. If you can, this is why I, I spend this time in the communion thing because I saw it. I saw it. What, what God revealed to me that Friday night up there in Redding, California, Pastor Bill Johnson and Randy Clark were ministering. Randy coming out of the Baptist background, God opened his eyes to the truth about healing and wholeness connected to the communion table. Same thing with Bill Johnson. And they were ministering together, and I recognize there's something going on here that I, I need to know. This is why you need, we need everybody. Brother Hagin would teach on faith. He focused on teaching faith the way he received it. And uh, he received it being in his... On his deathbed, he was, uh, and he would, he would take him, I don't know how long to turn a page. He talked about that, turning a page. But when he got over to Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and God began to reveal those scriptures to him, see, that's why, he, that's why he always started there, because that's what worked for him. But there's, that's not the only way you can receive healing. And the Lord showed me through the communion table because everybody wants to receive communion. And in receiving it, if I, if I teach you what I was taught, how to take hold of that, and this is what the children of Israel, and you see it in the, in the book of uh, um, Exodus. Is it Exodus? No, Psalms. Psalm 105, verse 37. When the children of Israel were getting ready to leave Egypt, God instructed Aaron and Moses to, to receive the Passover, it's the first Passover. And we're right now in the time of Passover right now. See, it, it, church, the church celebrated Easter a while back, but this is actually the real date. Passover, the lamb, he gave them instruction how they had to take the lamb, how to deal with the lamb, and, and, to eat, and then take the blood and put it on the doorpost of their house. So the death angel would pass over. When he saw the blood, he'd pass over it. So they, and, then, and, and during that whole Passover meal, God's healing everybody because they got this journey in front of them. They got to go to Mount Sinai. They got to go through the Red Sea. That's a major deal. Take a group up to the Red Sea and try to talk them into, we're going to go across there. No boat. Jesus' ministry, he had a boat. No boat. We're going to walk through it. Are you kidding me? Pastor, we're not, we don't trust you, Pastor. You know, you, you, you got to be crazy. You're crazy. Well... You know, they referred to Jesus. In the King James Version, you'll see this word beside. B-E-S-I-D-E, beside. 
They said Jesus was beside himself. If you go back and look that up in the Greek, you know, they thought he was lunatic. That's what the word is used, lunatic. They thought Jesus was lunatic. Even his brothers in John chapter 7. Look at that. It talks about his brethren right there. They did not believe in him at that, at that time. They thought he's whacked. It's our, it's our whacked brother. Yeah, there's some interesting story about how he got here, too. You know, they heard the stories. Born in a manger, Bethlehem. Wise men showed up. What is that all about? Got these weird guys showed up that came from way out of, out of town. And it wasn't just three guys on camels. It was an entourage. People remember stories like that. And they're telling him, you know that the, his brethren, you know, Mary, see, and I think everybody here in this church, you know Mary was not a virgin all of her life, just for the birth of Jesus. Joseph and her carried on a normal husband or wife relationship, and they had other kids. It's in the book. It'll freak people out that you try to tell them that, but especially that come from a certain church. You know, I, I've uh, kind of dented my family members by letting them know. Yeah. No. She wasn't a virgin all over life. See, that, then that, that makes that whole thing about sex is dirty. It's not dirty when it's done. Sexual. God, who do you think taught Adam? Eve did not come right away. You know, she, he had to make her later. And I'm sure she did the rest of the teaching later on. But uh, God had to talk to Adam about how to treat that woman. He's going to bring a woman here. I'm bringing you a woman. Get ready. Clean up your place. Hallelujah. Okay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So... <clears throat> A practical guide to the Holy Communion. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Talks about in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 46. In the NIV, it says, And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, one of the questions that came up is how often can we receive communion? And it says, uh, God's Word doesn't tell us how often to partake of the communion. But if you read the Bible, you'll see that the early church in the book of Acts was breaking bread. That's the communion on a daily basis as they met and went from house to house. Paul said when taking and talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper... For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, it says that means that you can take it as often as you feel you need to. Just remember what's going on. It says, and he said, and every time you do, you are simply ingesting more and more of Jesus' health and wholeness into your body. See, when, when they, take, they took that Passover meal, it says there was not a feeble one among them. And that was over, it was, it was around 2.5 million people coming out of Egypt. You can't, get, you can't get 10 people together that one of them doesn't have some kind of physical I issue. So when you're receiving communion, you come prepared. You come to say, you know, you say this. I am going to receive what I need to receive to make me whole. That's your part in this thing. You got to play it. Can, Jesus is not going to do all of it for you. You got to do it. You got to receive it. Expect it. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Glory to God. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, it's all going to come, never going to come the same way. So get used to that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. As, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I'm talking about Adam. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Romans 5, 19. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That's God. God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. That means he didn't commit sin on his own, but was made to be sin. That we might be made, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. When we drink of the cup as we receive the communion... God wants us to do it with the full realization of what the cup represents and what that means for us today. Beloved, the cup represents the blood of Jesus shed for the forgiveness or the remission. That's a better word. Remission of sin. It's not the atonement. The atonement was for one year. It would cover it's like you put your hand over a blemish or something. Take it off, it's still there. Remission, it annihilated. There's no record of it. No record of it. You have to receive that. God has done that for you. Beloved, the cup represents Jesus' shed blood for the forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1, 14. Ephesians 1, 7. Jesus himself said, For this is my blood, of the new covenant, which is shed for you, for many. Shed for many. That's what's sad. It doesn't say shed for everyone because not everyone received it. Shed for many for the remission. There's that word. For the remission of sins. Matthew 26, verse 28. So when you drink of the cup, be conscious that because of the Son of God paid the penalty for your sins, you have been completely forgiven and made righteous. And see, the thing is, you just were not, it's not just, be, you're not just forgiven of sins. You have been made anew. See, you can be forgive, forgiven of sin and still go to hell. God has to deal with that operating system that has to be changed. And it, that's what happens at the new birth. That operating system is born again. It's a whole new thing. It's not tainted by the sin of Adam. It's not tainted. It's a new operating system. Never before existed. You, you have to renew your mind to that fact because you, you, you approach God in this communion table when you know that you've been made worthy by the precious blood of Jesus, not anything you did, we cannot boast on anything we've done. It don't work. It won't happen. But when you believe you have faith in what Jesus did and how that he made you worthy, he made you brand new, then you can go right in that throne of grace and receive. Receive whatever God has for you. That's the way to go. Yeah, get used to it. Go in there. Go in there and receive everything. God, whatever you got in there. Got my name on it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll receive it. Thank you very much. I receive it. In Jesus. But you got to know about it in order to receive it. That's why it says there in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed... For a lack of knowledge. They don't know what they got. They don't know who they are. And God all the time has purchased this for you. It's purchased for the whole body of Christ. The whole world. They just got to, somebody's got to tell them. And they got to believe it and receive it. 
So, partake rejoicing that the blood of Jesus has given you the right standing before God so that you can always come boldly in his presence and find grace and mercy to help you in every point of need. Hallelujah. Find grace and mercy to help in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, Father, we just thank you. We take this, the bread, in the name of Jesus, the children's bread. It's the healing bread. He said, it's not right to give the children bread to the dogs, but we're not considered dogs. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we take this and receive the life of God, the Zoe life of God into our bodies, the top of our head, all the way through the soles of our feet. We receive life and health, eternal life, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just think on that right now. The life of God going through my body. See yourself healed. Stop. stop. Take authority over your mouth. Watch your mouth. Set a watchman on your mouth. You hear you say something wrong, stop, ask God to forgive you, and say, I won't do that again. Hallelujah. Not going to say that anymore like that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to live out my full length of life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The number of your days you shall fulfill. We all have a certain amount of days. Go for the longest one. If you desire. Hallelujah. Speak to your body. Stop whining. Take authority over your body in Jesus' name. Body, you know, you can do whatever you want in the regards to nourishment and nutrition and stuff. Know that certain things are not good for you. Sugar's not a friend, but, you know, you, there are other things, honey and maple syrup. Pastor uses maple syrup. Hallelujah. Thank Jesus would, too, if he had tasted it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's kind of entertaining to be around me and Carolyn. You'll hear one of us talk to our bodies. Body, knock it off. We're, we're enjoying life. <laughs> all of you are going to work. You're all going to enjoy life. Quit whining. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Get used to speaking to things. Some of you don't do it. You need to do it. Get over that. Tell the Lord you're sorry. I'll do it. Remember? Whosoever shall say. Whosoever. That means you. I'm a whosoever. Look in the mirror and say to yourself, I'm a whosoever. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and this one, come, and he comes. That's what the centurion said about Jesus. I recognize the authority that comes out of your mouth. So he said, I don't need to go. I don't, I'm not worthy. I'm not circumcised. He, he, was, he knew he wasn't a Jew. He said, I'm not worthy to go into your house. But speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. And that stopped Jesus, got his attention. There were certain people in throughout that gospel there that got what they were looking for, and they did not qualify uh, to be a recipient of it. It was their faith that received it. And Jesus acknowledged it. Your faith has made you whole. Not, not your right standing with God, but see, you, you're coming into the right standing with God with what you're saying. 
You, know, you don't go to heaven because you're good. You go to heaven because he was good. And you have faith in what he did. And you believe that. And you just say it in front of the devil. Yeah, make him mad. Anyway, so we take the cup. Thank you, Father God, for the precious blood. The precious blood of Jesus for the remission of sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go ahead and pass your little cups to the center or wherever those good-looking ushers are, our handsome ushers. You know, we have women ushers too, you know. Yes, ma'am. Psalm 141, 3. That's, that's one of the benefits of marrying the right woman. She feeds you scriptures. Psalm 141, right? Psalm 141. <clears throat> Verse 3, there it is. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. I'm going to go into 4 too. It says, incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Notice this, verse 5, it says, Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. He likened it as a kindness to straighten him out. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer sh also shall be in their, their calamities. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you stand with me, thank you, Lord. I don't know what you're going to do yourself. You got, you're getting out early. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. And the Lord make his face, just picture his face, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious unto you. And the Lord, Lord turn his face. Just watch. Just See, he's sitting on the throne. And he's going to look your way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I, I don't know if the... If there